Good morning, Pacific. Welcome to our online service. Thank you so much for taking the time to worship with us today. We pray that you would be blessed abundantly as you sing, pray, listen to the word, and join us at the table. If you are new to Pacific and joining us online today, thank you for allowing us to be a voice in your day. We hope that you would experience the love and peace of God as you join us in praising our risen and ascended Lord Jesus. Later in the service, we'll take communion together, and we invite you to prepare the elements and have them before you now as a reminder of Christ's presence with us all. Today, we begin our Summer of Renewal series. The name was inspired by a phrase spoken by BC's Minister of Health, Adrian Dix, in hopeful expectation for the months ahead as we seek as a province to recover from the effects of the coronavirus pandemic. This phrase seemed to be popping up in other areas too, and the first time I heard it, I had a sense that there was more weight and meaning to those words than perhaps Adrian Dix realized. I had a sense that God was going to do something significant, not just in spite of the unsettledness of the past few months, but through it. When we as a staff began planning for the summer months, the word summer of renewal stood out as a theme that we agreed the Holy Spirit was highlighting at the time. What could renewal mean for us here at Pacific and in the community around us? What might God be up to in the next season, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our relationships, in our hearts? For many people, this past season has been painful, traumatic, even devastating. For some, difficult circumstances have only been exacerbated and renewal couldn't seem further away. Without trivializing those negative experiences, but further seeking to validate them and bring hope in the midst of suffering, we want to take this opportunity to look for God at work, as Brandon encouraged us to do a couple weeks ago, and to stand on the promise of Romans 8.28 that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose, and that united with Christ in His sufferings, we are conformed to His image and are called His brothers and sisters. So be filled with hope for what God has in store for the months ahead. He is in the business of renewal. It is our prayer that as you join us over the coming weeks, you would be renewed by the Spirit in Christ to the glory of God the Father. So now I say to you, enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's worship him together now. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake you died Oh, 
that stone was rolled for good And the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come Unto the Father are restored And the Church of Christ was born And then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not kneel, it shall not faint By his blood and in his name In his freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me Oh 
on the ground And with one voice they pray A sacrifice was made And then your fire came They knelt upon the ground And with one voice they pray
Thank you for worshiping with us today. We so appreciate you joining us and we pray that you would encounter Jesus in our time together. In Psalm 16, verse 11, in the English Standard Version, it says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In this season, we pray that you would experience a renewal of joy in the presence of Him who guides every step and provides for every need. Now, as we take up our offering, we invite you to give online. Here's a video on how to do that. You can also give via our Pacific app. Here's how to do that. Thank you for your generosity in this season. We pray God's blessing over you, your family, and those you love. Please join us now for our prayers of the people. Let us offer our prayers together now, uniting our voice with Christ, who perfects our prayers. Let all that we are praise you, Lord. May we never forget the good things you have done for us. You provide for our every need, financial, emotional, physical. You forgive all of our sins. You are our hope and peace in a world of chaos. You have redeemed us from death and have blanketed us with love, mercy, and a sense of belonging like nothing else. When we feel overwhelmed by news headlines, we find comfort in Psalm 18. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. We express our deep thanks to our Savior by glorifying you with our lives. We say thank you with our mouths, our hearts, and through our love for others. We lift up to you now, Lord, those who come to mind who need your presence. We think of those who cannot work at this time. We think of those who work for the benefit of others. We think of those who teach and those who learn. We think of those who feel lost and directionless. We think of those who are poor in resources and poor in spirit. And we think of the church in persecution worldwide. We also lift up to you now, Heavenly Father, the many different global and political issues that are facing our world today. So many different issues are pressing on our hearts, and they are on your heart as well. We lift up to you our leaders in North America and pray that your wisdom be upon them. Be with us now as we hear your word this morning. Help each of us to not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well. Anoint our eyes to see your image residing deep within each person we meet. Anoint our ears to hear the cries of all who surround us, especially the needy. Anoint our hands to do gospel work. Anoint our lips to speak gospel peace, so that in all ways, in all times, in all places, we may glorify you. In the name of Jesus, we patiently pray. Amen. Good morning. So good to be with you this morning. Thank you, Alex and team and uh, those who prayed. Thank you for all the effort 
as you shape this service together. We are making our way into the summer, and I want to introduce to you a focus uh, of our summer series, which we are calling the Summer of Renewal. As I was thinking about this series, uh, my mind came uh, to the book of Ecclesiastes, where the wise guy said over and over again, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, we say similar things like same old, same old. Yet Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5, says this, the new has gone, or the old has gone, the new is here. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And he, he proclaims this. And it's not the only time he proclaims this in the New Testament and in his letters. We see it proclaimed all the way through Scripture. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, how we're thinking about this summer. And uh, because, you know, the gospel is always about the coming of newness into our situations. Our God is the God who loves to speak newness into our very lives, into our church, into our community, into our world. Think about some of the stories in the Bible. After the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we meet Abram and Sarah. And what was so new about their situation? Here was a geriatric couple who were giving birth to a new son who was a new hope, new life in a context of darkness. Or think about the Hebrews, the Hebrews under the oppressive kingdom and rule of Pharaoh. And God was out of the womb of Egypt, gave birth to a whole new community, and with promise, they were delivered. Hope, newness. Even when we jump into the New Testament, we meet Mary, the mother of Jesus, who in a context of darkness gave birth to new life, Jesus Christ, who now rules over all. In fact, whenever Jesus was walking around meeting people, it was very rare that newness did not happen. New stories, miracles, healings. If you encountered Jesus, new things would happen. In fact, the, about the only place where new things did not happen was when Jesus went back to his hometown, Nazareth. Remember? And, and his cousins, his neighbors that grew up with him, they just did not receive him well. In fact, Jesus was shocked that they had so little faith. And, and as a result, very little new happened on his visit to Nazareth. No miracles, it says in the Gospel of Mark. Well, as we considered uh, our summer series, it was Alex who, who overheard Adrian Dix in one of his uh, newscasts. And as he was answering some questions about what life might be like in this coming summer, he used this phrase to describe the summer. He said it will be a summer of renewal. As Alex reflected with us on that, it resonated with us deeply. And we just thought, exactly. Pacific, all of us, our community is in a season of renewal where all the normal ways of life have been so constricted that we've had to reinvent ourselves. This summer could be a time of renewal. Well, in fact, as you're thinking, we are looking forward to the possibility of a new lead pastor. That will be significant for us, something new. But I think as we enter into the summer, it's an opportunity for us to reflect well upon our lives, upon our church, and upon our society. Because we do need the newness of Christ in it all. And so we've invited a number of preachers and teachers to come and speak into this theme of renew. 
uh, today and for the next couple of weeks, we will have Mike Richardson, who would, who's going to talk about family and God's vision for family, so that our imagination may be renewed with God's thinking about family. I think you're going to love this series, and that's why we're inviting him to begin today. Brad is going to talk about renewing our, our, our enthusiasm around reading the Word and allowing the Word to shape our imagination. Oh, that's going to be important. We have Carolyn Ahrens, who's going to talk about renewing our spiritual disciplines. we got Ross Hastings coming to renew our vision about brokenness. We have Carissa Youssef from Food for the Hungry to talk about missions and the changing reality there and our imagination around that. We have good speakers coming and, who we, <laughs> and perhaps even uh, a lead candidate coming to visit us this summer. So it's exciting and a great opportunity. So I, I pray that as we travel through this series, we may not be like the people of Nazareth, that when Jesus shows up, nothing really happens. Rather, that we be a people open and ready to receive the promises of God and to be renewed in our vision. So I pray that you will be as excited about this series as I am. And may we travel together in this summer of renewal, expectant, hopeful, and fully renewed. In the name of Jesus, and by the power of the Spirit, because of the love of God the Father. Thanks. Welcome, Mike Richardson. Good morning. I've been invited to lead us in a study on family that's part of our summer series related to renewal. I'm calling this three-week mini-series, Renewal for Family, a Family Drama, because the reality is what family does not have its ongoing drama. So I, I want us to think about briefly the situation of the family in Canada. We're seeing family in transition in Canada. I've been able to watch this transition the past 25 years uh, as I've been teaching marriage and family introductory course at Trinity Western University as well as Columbia Bible College. And it's been fascinating to see how things have changed over the past quarter of a century. Uh, it was just 15 years ago in 2005 that the Civil Marriage Act uh, changed our definition of marriage in Canada. On the heels of that, uh, in our census of 2016, we realized that only 25% of families today are classified as a traditional family. Traditional family, by census definition, is a, a household that has a mom, a dad, and one or more children. So 75% of the households in Canada do not fall under the category of traditional family. There's also been a shift away from people marrying. Uh, in the last census, we realized for the first time that the majority of people in Canada over the age of 15 are unmarried. And year by year, we're seeing the marriage rate declining. We're also seeing the family size decline in Canada decade by decade. The largest category of police calls are related to domestic disturbances. And that would logically result in the fact that the number one stressor for most Canadians is family related. So the family is in transition and the family continues to have quite obviously a huge impact on us as individuals. So I'm excited about being able to take a look at what scripture says about family. And I've chosen to do this. We want to examine key biblical narratives in order to provide hope for renewed understanding and experience of families today. I'm hoping that you have an outline for the series uh, because the purpose of the outline, I've chosen to kind of look at this as a, as a drama, as a dramatic production. And the title, as I've already mentioned, is... The uh, Renewal for Family, a Timely Drama. And then we've got two acts and three scenes. And this is going to enable us simply to 
contextualize our walk through Scripture as we're looking at family as it was designed to be, then the challenge of defiance and how that impacted family, and then looking at the life of Jesus and reimagining what family can be. So let's jump right into Scripture today. I know most of us will have some kind of recollection around the creation story and can tell the creation story to others, at least parts of it. I'm hoping that as we begin today with a reinvestigation of the beginning of family, perhaps there will be some new insights and perspectives that will uh, have guiding power for us as we're examining our own family and looking at positive ways forward to experience renewal in the context of family. So we're only going to be able to do, it's kind of like the iceberg analogy, um, there's, there's so much in the uh, opening chapters of Genesis. Tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of pages have been written. And so we're just going to, to take a very, very small look at key passages that I think can uh, inform us in positive and beneficial ways. So as we open to Genesis chapter 1, we realize that uh, we find there the, the days of creation. Uh, on the sixth day of creation, God created the land animals and the creatures, and He also created Adam. So I want us to begin by looking in verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. We read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. And then we move on down to 31. It says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. So I want us just to unpack this initial biblical narrative that relates to family. Verse 26 says, let us make man in our image. Now, there are two primary trains of thought around this verse. Uh, the first train of thought, and it's where I personally land, is that this is a reference to the Trinitarian nature when God's saying, let us make man in our own image. And it can be a bit obscure, but, but that is language that can certainly be Trinitarian. Uh, another major school of thought is that this is simply the plural of majesty when we look at the grammar. So when the queen, for example, says, we are going to do something, she means me, but she uses we. And we, when it's referring to one person, is called plural of majesty. So there are a number of biblical scholars and have been through the ages that have maintained this isn't a reference to Trinitarianism at all. It simply is plural of majesty. But I, I personally have built a case that I think is solid, at least from my own thinking, that this is, this is very Trinitarian nature, particularly given the context we have as we look at the creation of man. So God said, let us make man in our own image, male and female. So it, it's very clear that at, at the beginning of creation, he created us male and female, both in his own image with equal worth, value, and dignity. So both men and women are made fully in the image of God, and we are his image bearers. Unfortunately, because of interpretations of Scripture uh, in centuries gone by, and even for some people today, there's often a hierarchy that is experienced where women are not given the same value in terms of uh, their worth because of the order of creation. But I think as we unpack these narratives, we're going to realize that God made it very clear men and women are both created in His image, and they both have value, worth, and dignity as He created and designed them. He says to them, be fruitful and multiply. 
So there is this, this blessing given to the fact that he has created one man and one woman, and then he has empowered them to be able to create his image bearers as a result of their union and their relationship. That's God's plan, God's design. I can only imagine the angelic hosts when perhaps God would have announced this plan to them. And just perhaps the horrified look of, you're going to trust them to do what? Why don't you just create all of the people? Don't leave this up to humans. And I could only imagine God's response being along the lines of, don't underestimate my creative genius and my brilliance. So this is God's plan and this is God's design that we see in Genesis. Now, he at the very end, he says, as he's looking at all the work he's done in six days, he saw all that it was made and it was very good. Our English translation loses a bit. What we find in Hebrew is, is a redundancy or a repetition of the word that we translate good. So in Hebrew, it basically says it was good, good. Now, that would seem very awkward in an English translation, but what we perhaps fail to realize is that in Hebrew, when you have that kind of duplicity of a word, it puts it in the superlative case. In English, we have good, better, and best, and best being the superlative. For the Hebrew language, when two words are exactly the same used in, uh, used in conjunction, that makes it superlative. So a better reading of this was, it was, God saw all that he had made and it was the best. There was no way to improve on that. So Genesis 1 gives us this overview and context and we see God has created man. This is the beginning of family then Genesis 2 would be like a, a movie that we might watch and we see a scene and then it says five weeks earlier and it takes us back. So Genesis 2 takes us back to give a little more context and then gives and then moves us forward in this creation narrative. And what we find in Genesis 2, in verse 5, it, um, it says, "...there was no man to work the ground." So God had made his creation. It was genius. It was brilliant. It was the best. But there was no man to work the ground. Now, this phrase is very important because unfortunately, all too often, when we thought about what happens later in the chapters of Genesis, we've looked at the situation regarding man and his relationship to work. And we've made the declaration that, well, work for man was a curse. No. That's not a reality, and Scripture speaks to that because the idea of work is clearly laid out in the very beginning. There wasn't someone yet to work the ground. So part of the design and intention in creating Adam was to provide someone who could work the ground. We also find in uh, in, in 7 verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So from the dust, God created man. This is important because we're going to see a few verses uh, on, down, on down in Genesis that man was going to be returning to dust because he had originally come from dust. So it's important that we're seeing what, what the narrative is telling us here. God planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed. Now, the word Eden is a word, when we look at the Hebrew word for Eden, it means pleasure and delight. So this garden was an amazing garden. We reference it in language today when we talk about an Eden, the Garden of Eden, being a remarkable place of beauty where God's creative design and his genius is so clearly reflected. This was the reality. Then it says in Genesis 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work 
and take care of it. So again, this was an opportunity and a privilege that man had to work. He was told to have dominion. This wasn't to abuse the land, but to be a steward of the land, to work, to work it in a very positive way. What we see here is the very premise and foundation for creation care. The idea of taking care of our world is not a new idea. It's far more than simply a political platform. It was a mandate given from the very creation of the world to take care of the world, to steward the world wisely. And God created man to do that. So there is this marvelous symbiotic union and relationship between humanity and creation that God ordained and orchestrated in the beginning. Now we read on, or actually I want to go back just a verse. It says in verse 9 that God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, and in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, this can be a verse that, again, we often skirt over, but it's important for us to camp just a few moments there. There is always significance in Scripture in geographical places as well as geographical proximities. So when we talk about something being in the center or in the middle, that has value. The directions in Scripture, the fact that Eden was in the East, has theological value and significance. So what the big deal about this tree, or these trees, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil being planted in the middle of the garden? Well, let's hold that question because we're going to revisit that just a little bit later when we look at a response, and this will be in our next message, that Eve has to the serpent about the tree that he references. But for now, remember, it's in the middle, and there is significance about its place in the garden. Then we have God has put man to work, and then in verse 18, this is the first not good that's recorded in Scripture. In the previous accounts of all that God is creating, everything was good. God saw it and it was good. God saw it and it was good. And we see that repeated and repeated till the, the climax of it was good, good. And then here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we have the first not good. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, this has been a, a term that has often been misinterpreted and certainly misused and misapplied for centuries. And it's important that we take a clear look at the word. Because when we think about someone being a helper, generally we think of an assistant. We think of a support worker. We might think of a child helping a parent. And unfortunately, too often in church history, we have seen women relegated to positions of service to men under the auspices that that's what they were. They were created to be helpers, that men are in charge and women are there to help because, quote, that's what the Bible says. Well, let's look at what the Hebrew words say because things can so easily get lost in translation. And there is a very powerful two Hebrew words, actually, that are combined to create the word translated here as helper. And those two words, one of them is strong and the other word is rescuer. So when God looked at Adam and said, it's not good that he should be alone, I'm going to create, he needs a strong rescuer. Now, all of a sudden, that takes the term helper and elevates it significantly 
from the level of doing servile kinds of jobs or secondary, having secondary kinds of roles. It's now a strong rescuer. And what is fascinating is there's more than a dozen times in the Old Testament that God uses that very word to describe his relationship with his people. He says, I am their helper. Now, does God help from a position of strength or weakness? Pretty obvious there, because you can help from a position of weakness as a child might help a parent bake cookies, helping from a position of weakness. Or you could help parentally or grandparentally from a position of strength when you're helping a child or grandchild learn to ride a bike. You're helping them. Well, it's very clear here that the word helper is coming from a position of strength, not a position of superiority, but a position of strength. If it's not enough that God used the word helper to convey his design for the creation of woman, he uses the adjective suitable helper. Now, again, we can look at that and think of all kinds of synonyms for suitable. She's an appropriate. She's a good. She's, we, we come up with different synonyms, but the Hebrew gives us, again, very clear insight because the Hebrew for suitable literally means it's a military term used for help that is absolutely necessary for the survival of someone else. So it's almost a left-right here in terms of what is woman? She's going to be a strong rescuer that is absolutely essential to the survival of man. Wow, perhaps a different understanding than centuries of perspective have offered as far as the role of woman. She is a strong rescuer. It kind of begs the question, what is she rescuing Adam from? And uh, many women friends and colleagues are quick to say from himself. And that probably is truer than we as men would like to acknowledge. But she's rescuing him from his aloneness. Not his loneliness. Loneliness is very different than aloneness. One is a condition, the other is an attitude. And she was given to man, woman was designed, to offset his aloneness, to be a strong rescuer that was essential for their survival as a team. So... Here, what we begin to see is the the very foundation of family with man and woman. And we're going to see husband and wife with equal worth, value, and dignity. Now, we can fast forward to the New Testament and we can see some different roles in family relationships. But none of these roles speak to the worth, value, and dignity because God said, they are equal image bearers of mine. He's made that so clear in Scripture, and we have done such a disservice not only to Scripture, but to to women throughout the centuries in seeing them in some kind of second as some kind of second class citizenry, because that has never been God's plan, design, or intention. And we see it clearly clearly rooted in Scripture and part of God's design from the very beginning. I think we could argue with all of the talk today about essential workers that woman was the original essential worker. She had to be there. This is God's plan. Now, we see that God causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep. God takes a rib, and so woman comes out of man. There's an interesting kind of play on words in the Hebrew language here because one of the words for man is ish, the word for woman is isha. So the two are very much connected linguistically because woman came out of man, and from that time all men have come out of women. 
So again, notice the interesting interplay between men and women based on God's design. And then we have this sentence, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now, this is a verse that is probably familiar to most of us, but look at the context and imagine if this were being read to Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve have just been created, and they hear, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. And perhaps Adam very sheepishly looks at Eve and says, what what is a father? And Eve looks back and says, I don't know. Do you know what a mother is? They have no idea what a mother and a father are because mothers and fathers haven't even come into being. I think it's fascinating that God in his wisdom and foreknowledge understood the challenges that were going to be inherent in family dynamics. And even before mothers and fathers existed, he gave directives to them. So we have this this amazing rationale given. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. We have three things that I want to point out very quickly here. A man will leave his father and mother. There's so much that we could explore here, but I'm going to suggest that in that we see a principle of priority. The leaving, we know culturally, was not that the man physically moved away from father and mother because he didn't. I would suggest that the idea of leaving is an idea of shifting relational priority from family of origin to the new family, from parents to spouse. There's all kinds of challenges and have been throughout the ages with in-laws, with separating from parents, with establishing new family units. God has talked about the fact that a man needs to leave his father and mother and then be united to his wife. And the word united means being bound together in such a way that they can never be separated. Here, we could explore, if we had more time, the principle of permanence. So we have the principle of priority, relational priority, a principle of permanence that God said, I I don't want them ever to be separated. And then they will become one flesh. The one flesh can be language that speaks to the production of children, procreation. So the principle of procreation, joining God. We find that this is a very powerful image And we're going to be exploring in our next message how the arrangement and God's design from the very beginning is actually a human reflection of the Trinity. But for now, we're going to close with simply the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So the curtain drops here on scene one about the the design for family and all is well. This is God's plan. It's important to keep that in mind as we look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when it talks about the old is gone, all has become new. The new is actually a renewal, going back to God's intentional plan for family. And there's incredible hope that we can experience that even now through Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word and the opportunity that it affords guidance for us today. Give us wisdom to know how to experience your renewal in our lives and in our families. Amen. Welcome to this table, the table that Jesus invites us to. Now you are sitting at your own tables, gathered with friends, your family, your children. It's a beautiful opportunity for you to all acknowledge that Jesus is present in your midst.
by eating this meal together. And so as you have the bread and this drink ready, I want you just to reflect on who Jesus is and what he desires to do for you by nourishing you with this good food. Jesus was always the guest when he was on earth. In the homes of Peter and Jairus, and Martha and Mary, he was always the one who was invited in. He was also at the meal tables of the wealthy, where he pled the cause of the poor. He was always the guest, upsetting polite company, befriending isolated people, welcoming the stranger. He was always the guest. But here at this very table and your table, right in your home, he is the host. He's inviting you. And those who wish to serve him must first be served by Jesus the host. Those who want to follow him must first be fed by him. And those who would wash his feet must first let him make them clean. For this is the table where God intends for us to be nourished and strengthened. This is the time when Christ can make us new. So come, those of you who hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, for a better life, for a fairer world. Jesus Christ, the living sacrifice, who sat at our tables, now invites us to his table. So don't be confused. This drink and this food on your table is being served to you by Jesus. Let's pray. Living God, send your Holy Spirit upon us as we share your heavenly meal. Nourish us with your grace so that we are strengthened to do your work in this world and unite us with you so that we are renewed and join us with your covenant people throughout time and space so that all the divisions, including social ones, will be healed. And so bless this food on this table. Unite us through it to you. And may we gratefully and joyfully remember that Jesus, our Savior, lived and died and rose to give us new life and make us new creations in him. Help us to live in the hope we discover through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Is not the bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? We who are many are in fact one body, for we all share in the same loaf. And is not the cup for which we give thanks a sharing in the blood of Jesus Christ. The cup that we drink is our participation in the life of Jesus Christ. So Holy Father, we thank you for this good food. Bless it to our bodies. And so I invite you to Take the bread and eat it. And remember that Jesus Christ's life is for you. And then in the same way, remember that this cup that you drink from is filled with the blood of Jesus Christ, which is poured out for the forgiveness of all your sins. So I invite you to eat and drink in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are at our table and we thank you that you nourish us with your life. 
not only making everything in this world new by your love and by your power, but making us new too. Renew us so that we may be your ambassadors in the world. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, Pacific, thanks for worshiping with us today. We're going to finish up with a new song, a song that I felt compelled was a bit of a theme song for this season as we enter into this summer of renewal. And so would you sing with us now, Death Was Arrested. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in Death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new now, life begins with you. It's your end. Oh, your grace so free.
May the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into these doors. See you soon. Thank you everyone for joining us here as we have been doing services virtually. We hope that you feel connected to us. We hope that you feel blessed by what you've heard and being a part of the service here at Pacific Community Church. I wanna invite each and every one of you to connect with us. No one needs to be alone at this time. We are all part of this community. We are in this together and there's many ways virtually to connect with each other and feel like you're a part of our family because you are a part of our family. If you have needs in your life that you would like some prayer for, we have a team that would love to pray for you. There's a link along the bottom. We would love to pray for you. Thank you again for joining us this weekend for this service. We invite each and every one of you to join us again here next week.